Hey folks. Hello. You cannot see me, but I promise that I am here. Uh, should we do brief intros? You want to go first, Ryan? Sure. So hi, everyone. Like I said, there's a picture of me. Um, pretty much look the same. Maybe my hair is a little bit different right now. But my name is Ryan Spencer. I am a board member here at Chay Half Night. And I'm really excited to dive into these topics with you. But at the same time, I'm also kind of be respectful of my own mental health. And so I offered to keep my camera off. I hope that's okay with everyone. But I'm excited to have this conversation today. And I'm Derek Eater. I'm president at Chai Hack Night. And yeah, also happy to be here. Um, first time presenting, but I've uh, co-hosted many times. So it's exciting to be on the other side of it tonight. Hi, I'm Samantha. Um, I have uh, been a, a board member for the past couple months now. So I'm excited to um, present something and uh, be part of this conversation. Okay, so um, this first slide, we're doing this because we care, not because we're experts. We, and when I say we, myself, Samantha, Derek, are not DEI professionals by any means. We don't spend our days working on racial and social justice issues as experts. And so the vast majority of the information that we're going to be sharing tonight is the work of others who have dedicated their lives to dismantling systems of oppression. And so as we go throughout these introductory slides, you're gonna hear me maybe cite some sources information and also I'm gonna make sure that those sources are gonna be cited on the blog because once again, we are not experts, but we are we do care about anti-racism and Chi Hackney community. We're part of the community and we feel like it is our duty and obligation to make sure that these conversations, um, there's space for these conversations and these conversations are being had. So in our 30 minute or so presentation, we're only going to be able to scratch the surface in our discussion, but we do encourage you to take the time, of course, to always continue learning about anti-racism, the different systems of oppression that exist, and how you can take action in your personal life, workplace, and the different communities you're a member of. So here we have a list of terms. Now, some of you may feel like, great, I already know all these terms. They're basic to me now. I can define them. I use them in daily conversations with no issue. On the other hand, maybe they're familiar to you, but you're not as comfortable reference them in daily conversations or talking about them in your day-to-day -day life. So regardless of your personal knowledge of these terms, I just kind of want to briefly go through them to create some common ground for the remainder of our discussion. So that way, you know, when we say white supremacy culture, for example, you have a sense of, okay, what are they referring to? What are they talking about? So the first term, racism. So throughout the presentation, when we say racism, referring to racism as the combination of racial prejudice plus the social and institutional power. So it's a system of advantage and oppression based on race. It's a white supremacist system. And it's of course different from terms like racial prejudice or hatred or discrimination. It's, a, it's more so about having the actual power to carry out systemic discrimination through institutional practices of society and you know shaping the culture that supports the racist policies in practice. So there is racism on the individual interpersonal level. You also have institutional racism, structural racism. So that is more terms than we currently have on this list, but there's a really great racial equity tool um, dot org website that you can reference for more, for more terms. So anti-racism. Anti-racism is the work of actively opposing racism by advocating for changes. This could be changes at the political level economic level, social level. On the, on the individual level, this could also be, you know, a person who supports anti-racist housing policies or workplace policies through their votes or, you know, how they show up to reduce racial inequity overall. And so some of you may be familiar with the work of Professor Ibram X. Kendi and the book, How to Be Anti-Racism, where he talks about racial inequity being the problem of bad policy and not just bad people. And so if you're not familiar with this work, I think it's a really great starting point for learning more about anti-racism. Of course, we have this little short definition, but that can't cover everything. Um, then white supremacy culture. So this is the idea. Well, actually, before I get into that, I do want to take a moment to kind of recognize, you know, we have to talk about what culture is to begin with. So culture, of course, is, you know, the knowledge, it's the experiences and the attitudes that people share over the course of generations. And it kind of becomes that way of life that you don't have to even think about anymore. It's just, it's programmed into your mind. It helps you kind of determine what you consider normal versus abnormal. And I'm doing quote marks right now. 
So, you know, what's acceptable in the workplace and vice versa. So for example, when you're hearing the term white supremacy culture, you know, that at first may bring to mind neo-Nazis or extremist groups or things of that nature. But when we're talking about white supremacy culture throughout this conversation, it's more so the idea and ideology that white people and the thoughts and the ideas and the customs and actions associated with white people are superior to that of people of color and their thoughts and beliefs and actions. And so white supremacy culture is not something that's only perpetuated by individuals, but it's also visible in our institutions. Um, so you think the media, you think education and healthcare, and then implicit bias. So this is talking about, you know, that unconscious or sometimes people call it the hidden bias that people, that people <laughs> unknowingly hold. So it affects our actions and our attitudes and creates real world impact outside of our own minds. Um, it's also very different from explicit bias, which is when you are aware of the bias that you're holding. And so all people, white, black, non-black POC, indigenous folks have implicit bias. And then DEI, I left it very basic and simple. And there's also diversity twice, because why not? So this is a common term in professional workplaces. You may have heard of DEI groups in the context of like, you know, your school or a tech company, but I think at Chehack Night, it does look a little bit different. And so it's more so concerned with, well, at least our breakout group is concerned with how we can make Chehack Night more inclusive and equitable, and also just be a system of support in the civic, in the civic tech space to talk about issues of accessibility and ethics and anti-racism work. So we look a little bit different than your average company or orgs DEI group. So why are we doing this? Why now? One of our goals or objectives that we have for Shahak Night is to you know, have a live weekly civic engagement event that includes diverse speakers and attendees. It's something that all the board members agree to work towards and part of that commitment requires us to reflect and continuously work towards making sure Shahak Night is an environment that is both inclusive and equitable. So it's not just about having diverse speakers and faces, but also do people want to stay? Do people want to continue engaging with Shai Hack Night? And also because Shai Hack Night, um, when we say that we are an anti-racist organization, well, anti-racism anti work is an ongoing and continuous process. So it requires learning, it requires the reflection, and of course, taking action. And so as an organization, we can't just release a blog post or a statement of support and assume that it's enough because we acknowledge something. And then on a personal level, because I personally am tired, I'm tired of waking up to Twitter posts and the news stories where, you know, a young black person's entire life can be reduced to their murder by the state. And then the media can sort of perpetuate a narrative of whether it was an intentional or if it was just an accident. And also because civic technology is not exempt from perpetuating the racial inequalities and the tools that are created and the research pursued and the data that is used. And so that is just one of a few reasons why we decided that I guess it's important to have this conversation and that we also plan to continue having them going forward in the future. So what does it mean to be anti-racist? So this is a quote by um, Professor Ibram X. Kendi, who I mentioned earlier. I really liked it. Um, I think it's really kind of reflective of the fact that there's, a, there's ongoing history that we have to acknowledge, but there's also a need to kind of rethink our own orientation and our own consciousness, rethink our own biases. And that, you know, once that happens at the individual level, we also have to kind of look further and outward to institutions. And there's um, another quote that I didn't list here by Angela Davis that I also think is really great, where she, um, she says, you know, in a racist society, it is not enough to be non-racist, we must be anti-racist. And so trying to resolve issues of white supremacy and structural racism can't occur if we're just simply claiming, I'm not a racist. It requires decisive action and not just passive declarations of racism is bad or it's harmful or I don't like it. It takes more than just, you know, resources are great, books are great, but it takes more than that. And just, you know, maybe retweeting activists or whatnot. And if that's the extent of your allyship with people of color, then it's most likely probably performative if you're not using your position and your influence wherever you are, whatever power you have to challenge racist policies and to support the local organizations who are doing the work. And so I encourage everyone to kind of think about how do you actively work to challenge notions of white supremacy within yourself? 
how do you address anti-Black racism as a white person or a non-Black person of color? When you're at work or you're in your educational programs or whatever it may be, do you consider how procedures or strategies advantage whiteness? Are you, are you helping to challenge them? Are you sort of in the background quiet thinking, oh, that's not right, but I don't know what to do? Do you spend money on businesses that are not owned by non-white people? These are just a very few examples of ways to be anti-racist, but also kind of orient yourself towards more action. And then what is white supremacy culture and how does it show up? So this is an image from dismantlingwhitesupremacy.org. It's a really great resource that we used heavily throughout the blog and this presentation. And it kind of shows um, this idea that, you know, at the textbook level, white supremacy culture is really about the ideology that white people and the ideas of white people and the thoughts and beliefs and what white people create are superior to what people of color are doing and their thoughts and their ideas and beliefs. And so, of course, race is that first sort of myth that has to occur and then superiority follows that. And so if you're wondering, well, okay, that sounds cool and great, I understand that, but what does that look like? Not in the abstract, but with concrete examples. And so maybe you already have some examples that come to mind that you've maybe seen in your own experience or you've read about recently in a book or in a TV show you love to watch, but it's, you know, it's something is, it could be as subtle as those professionalism standards that prioritizes, you know, Western English speakers as, you know, being more competent than everyone else. And that certain dialects or ways, ways of speaking shows that you're more intelligent versus the next person, or even just, you know, who we see in leadership roles and positions of authority and the idea of culture fit. That's you know used hopefully less and less every day, but let's recognize that it was previously used and probably still is to an extent in hiring practices in tech companies to justify you know who belongs on a team, who looks like a natural fit, and who doesn't. And so it's you know this idea, it's this reality of using whiteness as a standard and then judging everything else and everyone else against it. And so Toni Morrison has a really great quote that says. You know, it's the belief that American means white and everyone else has to just simply hyphenate. And so when you hear, you know, dismal diversity numbers in tech and the lack of, you know, non-white people and people of color in leadership roles, that too is a reflection of a culture that prioritizes whiteness. And so it's also, you know, it's when that civic technology org looks at technology as a recourse to maybe some fix some societal ills, but doesn't take the time to examine well, who gets to decide on what the tools, what tools are being created and how data is gonna be used um, and how, for example, you know, there's examples of blackness, for example, being equated with criminality or when that, you know, great idea for the neighborhood crime monitoring app turns into a way for residents to report black and brown residents at a higher rate. And so it's when we kind of realize that white supremacy culture has become sort of this ocean and this backdrop, then there's that need to sort of step back, step back and say, okay, how does this impact, for example, the data that's being collected and how does that impact the story that's being told? All right, uh, now we're switching, it's my part. Um, thank you, Ryan. Um, so building off of what Ryan was talking about, I'm going to talk a little bit about a section we have in our blog, which is learning to talk about cultural racism. Uh, and when I was researching how to sort of present this topic, I was reminded of this uh, commencement speech that I heard from David Foster Wallace back from 2005. Uh, and in it, he has a joke. Uh, and the joke is, there's these two young fish and they're swimming along and they come across an older fish and that older fish asks them, how's the water? And then the two fish kind of continue to swim on. And then after a little while, one of them turns and looks to the other one and says, what the hell's water? <laughs> uh, and it's a joke, but it explains, I think, well, a point that is like pretty important, which is that the most obvious, ubiquitous, important realities are often the ones that are the hardest to see and talk about, right? Swimming in the water, not being aware of um, your own surroundings. Um, and so while uh, the talk by David Foster Wallace was not explicitly about race, it was a helpful framing in that it's talking about how to and what to choose to 
consider and to think about. And that's really a useful frame I've found for starting to talk about these issues. Um, so being able to engage in this topic is not about how smart you are. It's not about how technically savvy you are. It's not about what positions you hold. In fact, uh, these things can actually get in the way. They can lead to arrogance and closed-mindedness. There's a phenomenon that I've experienced myself that I've seen pretty commonly in tech circles, which is commonly referred to as engineer's disease. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's the false belief that being good at one thing makes you automatically good at everything else. Uh, and it applies here. It's a, it can be a real uh, roadblock to being able to open up your ideas and mind about what, you know, what you're willing to consider. So the skills that I think are really important to bring to these kinds of conversations are empathy and awareness. Um, being willing to consider that the things you felt as maybe certainties your entire life, uh, they may be wrong. Um, and being open to accepting and challenging those long held beliefs. So some of you may remember, this was a, a there's a, a talk about two and a half years ago uh, by Heidi Massey on the right and Perna Abby Scanlon on the left here. Uh, it's, uh, it, their talk was called Envisioning Equity, Being Nice is Not Enough. It was the first time we really had these kinds of conversations at Shy Hack Night, it was back in 2018. Uh, and I rewatched it before we gave this talk because I, I really remember them doing a great job explaining a lot of this. So still relevant today, I would really encourage folks to go um, go on the Chai Hack Night website and dig up this, um, this presentation, um, number 360. Um, so in it, there's a number of points I just wanted to reiterate. Um, talking about race and racism will make you feel uncomfortable, especially if you've never talked about it before. If you're white, this might make you feel the need to disengage or run away from those conversations to avoid that feeling. Um, and that's actually um, it's worth noting that there's uh, this really helpful resource that we've used in the past at Chai Hack Night. It's the characteristics of white supremacy culture. And one of them is the right to comfort. This idea that no matter the situation, you have the right to not be uncomfortable and that any situation that leads you to be uncomfortable is something that you have the right to walk away from and disengage with. Um, that's not helpful here. Um, it's really important that when you have these conversations, when you do get uncomfortable to recognize that and to really sit with it and think, why? Why do I feel uncomfortable about that? Um, and it really can help, uh, it can really help you think and, and process in that moment, some of the, these beliefs that you have that can help you learn. So uh, it, it's also worth noting that, you know, many times because as Ryan mentioned, we, we live in a white supremacy culture that persons of color living in this society oftentimes feel this kind of uncomfortableness every day, whether or not you realize it or not. Um, and so it's, it's just not fair that they have to feel that way and that you don't. And so it's an important thing um, to really recognize. Uh, they also in this talk, talk uh, introduced a concept that I thought was really useful. Um, you've maybe heard of safe spaces before. Uh, that's actually not a productive um, phrase or term to use here. Um, again, it kind of goes back to reinforcing this idea that I shouldn't have to be made to feel uncomfortable. Um, that's what this idea of a safe, safe space is. Um, instead, a useful way to think about it is being in a brave space, a space that is more open to having you and others around you be willing to make mistakes because that's actually a space where you can learn. You can't learn unless you're making mistakes. So uh, we have uh, in the blog post a number of really helpful resources that I found to be useful and that we all found to be useful in, in terms of just engaging with this topic for the first time. Uh, one of them uh, is uh, So You Want to Talk About Race, which is a really great book. Um, there's a TED Talk that we have a link to. Um, let's get to the root of uh, uh, Racial Injustice uh, by Megan Mean Francis. And then this is really great um, ra dismantlingracism.org workbook that uh, we would definitely recommend. So that's all in the blog post. So you might be wondering, what does this have to do with civic tech? Uh, what, what is occurring in tech equity? Um, I think it's really important to note that when we're talking about 
building anything, especially technology, who's at the table matters when it comes to building that technology. Uh, making uh, anything requires hundreds or thousands of decisions and whether or not you're aware of it, those decisions are based on your life experiences and your biases, whether or not you recognize them or not. Who gets to make those decisions uh, directly affects the kinds of tools that get built and, and who they're for and, and what they do. Homogenous, non-diverse teams have the potential for dangerous blind spots. When you don't, when you haven't, don't have a group there to help think about all the different angles, all the ways that something could help or harm, you could really open yourself up to doing harm, even though you have good intentions. A really uh, ripe space to identify examples of this is in the criminal justice system, especially technology built for it. This is an example from ProPublica. They did a, a report and a dive into machine bias uh, in software that's used to predict future criminals. And it pulls in and reinforces existing biases and it is biased against black people. Um, so I'd re recommend folks reading that and just learning a little bit more about how that can happen. So it's worth uh, just spelling out that most tech circles are not racially diverse. Um, I have a chart to show you that. <laughs> this is from the Equal, uh, Equal Employment Commission. Uh, it's a government agency. And this is a chart of demographics for the high-tech industry. And you can see compared to all other industries in uh, the United States, it is, it's, it's disproportionately white and disproportionately male. And so that is, that's statistics for the entire uh, country. You might be saying to yourself, but we're in civic tech and tech for good. Surely we don't have this problem. Uh, well, turns out we do. Uh, there's some, uh, a really great report that was put out a few years ago called More Than Code. And they interviewed and did a ton of really amazing work to just look at uh, in, with sort of open eyes, the, the sector that we're in, um, tech for justice, tech for good, civic tech. And they did uh, a survey and they found this, you know, the, the demographics are slightly different, but they pretty much reflect that of, um, of the broader um, tech um, community. So we're not really different than the rest of the broader tech community. So I wanted to um, also just cite an example that's maybe a little closer to home, um, you know, going back to this idea that technology can easily cause unintended harm and talk about a project that I actually worked on. So this is a screenshot of a project that is no longer up, um, but it's a website that I worked on a few years ago called Crime Around Us. Uh, it basically takes data from the city's open data portal, crime reports and then makes it very easily and accessible for anybody to filter and search and browse that information. Um, and if you've been in civic tech enough, you probably um, have seen apps that use crime data. It's a pretty popular um, data set to draw from because it's a large data set um, and there was a lot of excitement around it, especially when it was first launched. We took this site down because after we learned a little bit more about the patterns of policing and the racism that's just really part of policing in Chicago and in America, um, that this tool causes harm even though we didn't intend it to. We built it for community organizations to actually use for their own grant writing and reporting. So it really did come with, you know, we didn't just pull this out of the air. We really did have folks we wanted to help with this. But the problem with it is, is it displays this crime data in a way that is not critical or does not question in any way the source of that data. Um, there are existing biases, as I'm sure if anybody is from Chicago is aware of, around the safety, um, perceived safety of certain parts of the city of Chicago on the south and the west sides. And the fact that we display this um, crime data uh, uncritically, it helps perpetuate those narratives. Um, crime is reported where there are police and where the cops are. And in turn, when there are more cops, showing this kind of data justifies sending more cops there. So it reinforces again, this negative stereotype about these neighborhoods that are again, predominantly black and Latinx of being violent and unsafe. And so we took this app down because 
Crime data can be useful um, in some contexts, but just displaying it without any kind of context around it or any kind of scrutiny about the systems that came to create it, um, that is, is something that really can and does cause harm. So I'll turn it over to Samantha next. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, Ryan and uh, Derek kind of uh, went through, you know, what anti-racism uh, looks like and a very tangible example of um, why anti-racism is relevant to uh, the civic tech space. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a little bit like how you can think about um, anti-racism within your own um, as concepts within your own organizations or workplaces and so forth. Um, for all, anti-racism uh, fits into this group slash organizational framework known as DEI, which uh, Ryan brought up already. I'm just gonna run through sort of what those words mean um, briefly. Um, so the first term is diversity. So diversity is just kind of a measure of how varied um, and how much uh, representation um, these groups have from different um, like different uh, groups. Um, equity is the next term in DEI. Uh, equity, uh, not to be confused with um, equality, is sort of a measure of how just and fair um, the organization is towards those groups. That is, you know, ensuring that everybody is getting um, the tools that they need to succeed and grow and provide, you know, uh, an environment to do such um, within that organization. And then inclusion um, is sort of like, well, how do we get there? Um, how do we ensure um, that, you know, we're being just towards um, the different people that are within our organization? Um, and uh, Derek brought up uh, Heidi and uh, Prina's talk earlier about envisioning equity. Um, but in it, they say that, you know, we don't really need to think about like, we don't need to like push for diversity if you are, you know, if the end goal is equity in your organization and the way you get to equity is by having these inclusive practices. Um, so again, one thing that uh, Shai Hackney is doing is, you know, we have this conversation with this, uh, uh, or put this blog post together in order to, you know, foster inclusivity within our community. Um, that's something that's going to be ongoing. It's going to have all of these resources that we're talking about um, in it uh, as an ongoing uh, resource. Um, one resource I found was a TED Talk by Janet Stowell. Um, and uh, her speak or her talk was called um, "Getting How to Get Serious About Diversity. Um, and one statistic she cited in that talk was that um, basically, a marginalized group um, needs to be like about 30% of an organization and to have their concerns be normalized. And so, um, depending on how large or, you know, where that group is, you know, no one marginalized group is really going to have all of that representation. And so that's why, you know, within an organization, you, we all really need to work as allies together to ensure that our experiences and voices are um, heard and normalized. Um, so within our organization, your organization, a workplace, you might have a couple of questions like, you know, what are some uh, resources that I can have to, you know, uh, to stay informed and learn as an individual? Um, another question you might have is, you know, what actions can I take uh, to, you know, myself today to promote racial equity? Um, and one thing I invite you to do is just kind of really be critical about the way that, uh, or like the places that you work or the organizations that you're a part of, um, there's some discriminatory practices that are just straight up illegal. Um, and, you know, each workplace or depending on, you know, the organization um, needs to have like a, a process in a place in order to, you know, field concerns about discriminatory practices within an organization. Um, and this process needs to um, be anonymous and also, um, or at least initially be anonymous um, and have no fear of uh, reprisal. So yeah, just looking at that process like is a good starting place because it gives you a sense of like, you know, how accessible is it for me to actually voice my concerns within, you know, my own, you know, company? Um, and what, is, what has it looked like for people who have done so in the past? 
Um, and it's hard to like, even like uh, recognize like what might be an example of a discriminatory uh, practice or even like something like in tech, for instance, like something that you might be coding in design. And one question, again, like Derek brought up in something that he was working in was, well, should we have built this? Like, is this something that, you know, we needed to do? Um, and I think like, again, something I invite you to do is kind of continue to ask yourself this question um, on any project that you're working on and that you're a part of, like really be critical about like who you're empowering um, who does this help, but who might this potentially harm? Um, and what steps can you take like for your work in this uh, process to minimize the potential of harm, as well as, you know, uh, bringing this to the attention of whoever might, you know, take action to get for or against, you know, continuing with this project and so forth. Um, and let's say you do recognize that, you know, something that you're working on, that you're building, might actually be harmful. Well, what should you do? I actually found like this really short little list um, that the uh, California Civil Rights Law Group put out. Um, and it's just a list of six things and the sources up there and we'll also have it on the blog. Um, but essentially it's, it has a series of six things that you can do right then and there. Um, first off might be, you know, pretty obvious. Like if you know something that you might partake in um, is going to harm someone, don't participate in it. Um, again, that might be hard initially. Like you might be an unwittingly a part of something that you may or may not like initially perceive as you know being harmful. You could think it's like you know really helpful or not see what's wrong. But that's you know why having a very team is so important um, and having you know inclusive practices in place so that people um, feel like they can voice their concerns um, because it helps you cover blind spots. Um, so if, uh, if you do see something like that, you, sh you, sh you yourself should intervene. Um, you should bring this up. If you are coming from a place of privilege, especially, you should bring up that this is something for concern. Um, or if you see your co colleague or coworker or somebody working, bring it up. You know, again, you should be uh, backing them up in that. Um, tell other people about it. Tell people, like, bring it up to your management bring up to other people on your team. Like definitely don't let it, you know, don't let it die. Um, and then while these conversations are taking place, make sure you ensure that you're, um, while also you're stepping up, you're also giving space to other people who are might be directly impacted by um, whatever it is that you might be working on or wh whatever it is that might be taking place um, and be a witness for them and they do call upon you. Um, and lastly, like, again, like we're always, uh, learning and just continue to keep doing that work so that as you know these issues come up you're able to recognize it but also be an ally to people um, as they bring it up as well. So um, there are a few places that are talking about um, that have like guides already. Um, the National Museum of uh, Amer African American History and Culture has a guide on talking about race. Um, Racial Equity Alliance uh, has their own uh, racial equity guide. Um, CoSensus is an inclusive survey software um, designed by Theme uh, Social Labs. Um, and then uh, Chicago has a Together We Heal initiative toward equity. Um, and they have a, uh, a toolkit that fosters these types of work uh, conversations. Um, I was able to grab all of these from our Slack channel. Um, we have a channel devoted directly towards anti-racist uh, resources, so I highly um, recommend and invite you to join our Slack. Um, another thing that uh, Shai uh, has is our own Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Um, last summer, we hosted um, or uh, facilitated a discussion um, about Black Lives Matter, and it was a talk about 40. Uh, cons consisting of about 40 or so uh, members of the Shy Hack Night community. Um, it was a really good discussion. We're um, excited to have more of that. Um, we do uh, also want to mention that, you know, we make uh, DEI like one of our goals. Um, we are, our goals for this year to track the diversity of our membership presenters and co-hosts. 
excuse me, um, ensure that at least 30% of our presenters are people of color and ensure that at least 50% of our cohorts are from uh, underrepresented groups. Um, we also have a breakout group that uh, meets every Tuesday after our, our feature presentation. Um, tonight, we're gonna be continuing this discussion on anti-racism and civic tech. Um, later, we will be talking about inclusivity um, in design, um, as well as career tra transitions into civic tech. Um, and in the future, who knows, we, but we want you there. So definitely um, join us. And yeah, you could join us by becoming a member or just continue to tune in to our, uh, our uh, weekly presentations. Or you can also, like, if you know of any organizations or speakers who are, are you know, committed to working uh, on anti-racism and uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, or any organizations who are working on projects like that, um, feel free to email our booking team at uh, booking at shyhacknight.org. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Yay, we did it. <laughs> All righty, thank you very much. I wish that uh, the attendees on the live stream could also unmute and applaud right now. Uh, I've, I've done other presentations in tools where everybody could do that. Of course, that has the ability to for anybody to unmute, which is stressful. But that was an, an excellent and eye-opening presentation. So thank you so much, Derek, Ryan, and Samantha. Um, we have a couple of questions for you. Um, Lori, do you want to kick off with the first? Sure. So um, let's start with uh, when, when someone is starting a civic tech project, are there red flags to look out for to recognize data sets or uses that could be harmful, uh, like the thought process that Derek explained about the crime data? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I think it's, um, it really depends on the context. Um, I mean, I, I can't really offer um, like a one size fits all, which I, I realize is a frustrating answer, but it's also that kind of, I think it's also like a common thing for folks in tech, especially to want to think of like one size fits all types of solutions. Um, so that's like thinking that I think can be harmful or not helpful here uh, and thinking that, oh, if I just check the boxes, it'll be okay. Um, I think the, the questions that um, Sam had on the slide for her section are really helpful. Just asking, um, who is this helping? Uh, who can this be potentially harming? Um, uh, you know, and, and can you minimize the, the potentials for harm once you've recognized that? I really think, um, you know, like you're working on a tech project, you might be like neck deep in it and you might not know all the ins and outs of it, but we have amazing resources on the internet to go research a lot more about what you're doing um, and the space you're in. And I think there's a lot you can find just from researching that way. Um, and yeah, seeking out um, potential criticisms about whatever it is you're working on. Um, I think uh, those are, that's where I would start is just trying to do some of that background research. You know, you want anything to add, Sam? Um, yeah, no, I think that was pretty great. Um, yeah, just to reiterate, like, yeah, just, I think when you're, especially when we're, we're working with data, um, there's like that adage, garbage in versus garbage out, or garbage in, garbage out. So I think when you think about your tool, um, again, like who do you think is going to be using this? And does your data accurately reflect like your end user? Like, does it capture that? And as you're like going through that data set, um, like, you know, asking yourself these questions, like certain things like tend to come out, and especially, and a lot of it too is just like trial and error. And like, you might get to a prototype and it's like, you see it in action and it's just like, you know, not working. So yeah, I think it is definitely something that you have to keep practicing, but I think part of it too is just being aware and like, again, like just taking that first step, like I'm working on this project, is, is the data for it actually. Mm -hmm. 
And I'll add one more thing, which is like in the context of like a civic tech project or maybe a project that you have more direct control over. Um, I think it can be um, not a thing you think of or something that might be like a little intimidating to consider at first, but if you're building something that's supposed to like help a certain group of people, um, you should talk to those people. Like you really shouldn't be building something if you don't know anybody who's actually experiencing this problem. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of ways to get around that, right? Like, I mean, I think there's oftentimes people will do projects such as Hack Night that are based on, on, on a project or an experience that they themselves have encountered before. That's a great start, right? Like you're actually there, you've experienced this issue, you wanna make an improvement on it, but don't stop there, right? Talk to more people who, who might also be experiencing this. Um, so that, that's just something to like, that's a good sort of process um, from like just like a user interview, user research kind of perspective that would be like a helpful tool just for any project. That answers the follow-up question that I had uh, too, which was how often do, or like, is it a common thing that breakout groups uh, include as part of the team that's building things, uh, members of the groups that those breakout groups are supposed to help? Oh, sorry, you cut off at the end there. What was that last part? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I said that, well, you answered the follow-up question, which was basically just uh, how often do groups include the members of the groups that they're trying to help? Yeah. So like the tech projects that Chayak does. I mean, does. I think the yeah. answer should be always, right? Um, it's not, but it should be. Um, you know, in the civic tech space, uh, there's a, a, um, a really, you know, popular mantra that was, you um, sort of uh, led by Lauren Ellen McCann called a build with not for um, that applies here. Um, and even going further out uh, the whole concept of participatory action research, nothing about us without us is the same. It's the same concept, right? Just like, don't go be building things that are not about you, like bring the people along who actually are going to benefit or or be like being affected by the thing you're making. Um, okay, so another question is, are there areas that you think are overlooked in civic tech because practitioners aren't being affirmatively anti-racist? Like questions that aren't asked or tools that, that could be built but aren't? Hmm. I got a few, but you wanna, you got, got anything you wanna <laughs> mention, Samantha? Well, um, one really glaring area is definitely like, um, I think in the area of like public health, um, a lot of times, well, one specific example I have is like, you know, the, um, the, uh, the pulse oximeters that they use to test you know, oxygen levels for uh, COVID patients um, has to be like under certain thresholds, you know, in order to um, admit them into the ER. And for people with darker skin, the way, the way that they work is that um, it uh, sends like a flash of light through the index finger and um, it basically measures how much light gets emitted um, through to the device. And in people with darker skin, like not as like light gets absorbed in your skin. And so they would register that um, based on, so the more light that gets absorbed, the higher it'll assume that, you know, the oxygen level is. Um, but because the research um, for those devices is based mostly on, you know, people with lighter skin, um, mostly male, like it like biased um, people with darker skin and they were, you know, being registered as having higher levels of oxygen than lighter skinned um, uh, other people on lighter skin. So I think the area of like public health and just like scientific research in general, um, again, garbage in, garbage out. Like if we don't have a data set that like really is inclusive of, you know, the people that are actually gonna be using it, then um, it's gonna, in a way it's gonna, or it might actually be harmful in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think in my experience kind of building off of that, 
you know, I think a, a great resource that we always point people to is the city's data portal or just like data sets the government's putting out and they are great resources. Um, but, you know, it's also really important to like scrutinize those data sets and recognize that they don't show a complete picture. They are the product of a process, a process that was probably not put in place with your app in mind. And so you're gonna have a lot of potential pitfalls. So like really before you just go and like throw dots on a map from this cool website, you know, this cool data set, really think about what this is showing and what is not showing, right? And all the different things that could go into changing and impacting the way that that data shows up. Um, and again, it comes back to this idea of like, I mean, it's it's a little more nuanced than garbage in, garbage out, but like you can certainly get garbage out of it if you don't consider these kinds of things. Yeah, um, thank you both for that. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, the next question that we have is, if you're making a career transition, how can you strike the balance between breaking into the industry and being actively or vocally anti-racist? I mean, I guess I would hope you don't have to make a choice there. Um, I would hope that you could find organizations that uh, do reflect those values or at least are willing to be open to change and critique. Um, I think there's a growing, I mean, so I'll say like, I'm like, I have a company, I'm an employer and we are small, but we really do value having different opinions and we really do value um, things to constantly try to improve our organization. Um, and like, there's just, in many ways, it, it is a competitive edge over other organizations because we have a lot of people apply for our jobs, you know, because, because of that. So you could, you know, from an employer perspective, I think that that's something that employers should be thinking about, especially in this, uh, you know, in this day and age when like being vocal and being, um, you know, uh, uh, really pushing for racial justice is something that like, I think is something that organizations really should be leaning into. Um, and so hopefully they are. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Samantha. Um, just briefly, I'll just say like, you know, I'm a black woman and I, I do understand like need, needing to toe the line. Um, and yeah, I guess when I was, you know, first getting started, you know, being a working professional, like you pretty, you pretty much take like any opportunity that you can get, but I think you know, having a little bit of experience gives you a little bit of privilege. Um, but if you are someone who like historically has privilege and can like, you know, be challenging um, at these organizations, then I would say maybe you utilize that as much as you can. But if you're someone who, you know, again, kind of has to walk this line, I would say, I mean, prioritize like what it is that you want to get out of an organization. Like what in particular do you want to learn and really be critical about you know, and like ask other people who work there too, like, is this actually an environment for me to learn at? Um, like, do I, would I feel comfortable with, like learning here? Um, but yeah, that, that's something that we can also discuss um, at our DEI group as well. That sounds like a much more helpful answer than mine. <laughs> um, all right, one last question. Are there any civic tech projects that you know of that are strong examples of anti-racist? Hmm. I mean, I guess, you know, without getting too deep into it, it's like define civic tech, right? I mean, I think you could look at a lot of different projects, like, I don't know, look, look at any of the websites that like all the organizers for Black Lives Matter put together and like the ways they use technology to organize. Is that civic tech? Like you could think of it that way, right? Maybe they don't think of themselves in that way, but I think it really just depends on how you wanna think about it. And I guess that's something for me at least that's been like a helpful to like break out of that box a little bit. Like civic tech, I think is a useful frame but not always, right? I think um, to limit yourself to just thinking that like civic tech is in and of itself is like a little bit limited. Um, and I think it, it stunts your ability to think about 
other stuff that's going on. There's so many amazing organizations out there doing amazing things with technology um, and whether or not they, they probably never heard of civic tech before. And I think if we really wanna improve civic tech, I think we should be going outside of this space and, and seeking out those kinds of organizations and projects to learn from them. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess I, well, I, I don't want, I won't an, add to your answer, um, <laughs> but makes a lot of sense. Thank you again, uh, Ryan, Derek, Samantha, for, I think I already said, but eye-opening presentation. Um, yeah. Another another round of, of applause that will be mostly silent and also expressed through clap emojis on the YouTube chat. Yeah, thanks for having us. This was great. I appreciate um, I appreciate both of my co-presenters and, and having the opportunity to present to Chai Hack Night. Yeah, thank you.